Sorry about that, guys. There we go. Okay, we're in. I'm um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> when Sharon wrote me, she was like, uh, hey, can you start the Zoom? I'm like, what Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a Zoom. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Kate. Kate. Hi, Kate. <sighs> so um, are we all set? Do you guys want to, how, how does the sound sound? Is it okay? How does the sound sound? <laughs> It's the top of the hour and I'm just waiting for a few more people to log in and we should be ready to go. So I'll just give a couple more minutes and we'll take off. Well, welcome everybody to today's Folio Forum. You are lucky to get a nice and exciting overview of the resource access uh, work that has been going on in the Folio project. The Folio Forum is sponsored by our partnership of the Open Library Environment with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Sharon Wiles Young. Director of Library Access Services at Lehigh University, and I currently serve as the chair of the Folio Product Council, and I will be your host today. Today's forum will be recorded as all forums are recorded, and the recording will be available on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. We have muted all participants to ensure good sound quality, and we ask and encourage all participants to ask questions in the Q&A box at, on your screen, um, and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, uh, please use hashtag Folio Forum, and also discussions can be continued on discuss.folio.org. So without further ado, our speakers today are Deborah Lamb, Assistant Director of Access and Administrative Services in the Hospitality, Labor, and Management Library at Cornell University. And Kate Borum, uh, who is the EBSCO Product Manager and uh, Folio Product Owner Lead. So I will turn this over to Deb and we'll get started. Thank you. Well, well, that would be good if I could get my screen to move ahead. There we go. Hi, folks. This is Deb. My uh, title took up, I think, three quarters of the presentation time I've been given. So <laughs> I'm going to charge right ahead. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are and how we work. And then I'm going to hand it over to Kate, who's going to do the heavy lifting and show you examples of how our work has progressed. And after Kate, I will wrap it up by talking about some of the lessons we've learned, and then there'll be time for questions and answers. So here is the charge for the resource access SIG. You can see that it's very far ranging, running the gamut from the granular day-to-day -day activities that we all do to higher level activities, such as actually creating the structure and the business logic under, work, under which our CERC apps will function, as well as reporting, and consortial activities such as interlibrary loan and shared collections. It's really good for us to be in on the development from the beginning because we're the ones who know what we do to, and what we need to get us through the day. And we're more than happy to share that information. Well, who are we? We're a very collaborative and a very vocal group. We have many folks from many places, both inside the US and outside. For example, it's 11 a.m. here on the east coast of the United States for me, but it's 5 p.m. for Kate over in Germany. 
We're especially thankful to have people from Chicago and Lehigh, as well as Andrea with her experience at Penn before moving to Duke, because they've been through this process before recently, and they act as our very able guides. You also see we have people from Texas A&M, from Cornell, and places in Germany such as HBZ. We have a dedicated group of UX folks, developers, project owners, and product managers from EBSCO and Index Data, as well as from Olay who've been assigned to work for, with us, which is nice because they've gotten to know us and we've gotten to know them, and it helps to have that consistency. We have a wide variety of communication channels for the SIG and also for the Olay and Folio environment. I'm going to show you a few slides of what it looks like, but while I'm on this slide, I want to once again thank Andrea Leungman, who is our ABLE convener. She's the one who represents resource access to the product council, and she's also very adept at herding cats and trying to keep us all on task. This is an example of the discuss site on Folio. It's a web forum. It has categories and topics and posts, and it's used for asking questions and having discussions that require more than just a few sentences. This is an example of our wiki space. All of the SIGs have wiki space. We use ours to keep our minutes, and we all have a shot at taking the minutes. And because you know those who write the minutes write history. It has also been, has our requirements list as well as links and other useful information. Having a record of our minutes is also useful when we have questions about issues we may have talked about in the past that come up in a different context and asking why did we make that decision when we made that. We meet by Zoom. We meet twice a week. This is what our meeting looks like. You can see many of us are muted, but I will tell you we really are a very vocal group. Um, and I think the developers have found that access services is actually a term that means exception. And we have a lot of exceptions. When we began to think about what we were aiming for, we wanted to have both goals and aspirations. The goals for me are more about what we call V1. That is those things that we need to handle basic operations. But we should not be constrained by those. And that's where the aspirations come in. As we work through the issues, we find that much of what we do is really a workaround and not a workflow. We need a system that will be flexible and not overly complicated, having the ability to reuse policies and not have to create everything from scratch. And while we do many things in a similar manner, each of us do things differently because of local customs. We can focus on the commonalities, yet create something that can be useful to each of us in our particular situation. The communication piece is also a big one for us. Having one place to find out as much information as we need is not only useful for us, but it's also a public service to our patrons as well. In addition to our goals and aspirations, we have working principles. It's a UX-driven design process that's also very iterative, and we aim for a flexible outcome. We in CERC are very much aware of the fact that we're constantly training staff, especially student assistants who work at our CERC desk. Therefore, whatever system we create needs to be intuitive. And this also means cutting down on jargon that might mean something to us, but not to anybody else. And sometimes jargon means something to us in access services and something different to somebody, say, in technical services. So it's good to reduce as much of the jargon as we can. I spoke before about how good it is to have as much information about a patron or an item in one place with the ability to drill down easily for details when necessary. To be able to see all that needed information without having to open yet another module is again a public service that saves us and the patron time. We began very long ago, it seems, <laughs> by working on an extensive list of functional requirements. What is it that we need to do our job, and what is it in our current system that works or doesn't work? We work with the folks from Index Data, EBSCO, Sam Hang, and Olay when they needed clarification of what it is we were trying to say. We wanted to include as many voices as possible to make sure that we didn't miss anything. From there, the discussion got more granular, focusing on a particular need, such as a request form or creating manual fines and fees. 
We'll then review the wireframes and functional screens. Again, communication coming from the SIGs back to the developers, functional owners, and designers. And then we wash, rinse, and repeat as many times as we need to to get our final desired outcome. So now I'm going to hand this over to Kate to demonstrate what this really looks like in reality. Thanks, Deb. That was an awesome introduction. I hope my bit can stay as lively. Let's see here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Let's find my starting slide here. Okay. So just building on um, what um, Deb was explaining about the requirements process, I thought I'd start with this slide. Um, which illustrates the requirements process we are generally following, not only in resource access, but across Folio. Sometimes the order varies um, and different teams use different tools and, and have slightly different artifacts, but it's, it's generally how we're working. So the requirements process begins with two fundamental resources you see at the top of this diagram. Um, the first is the 2018 V1 scoping document, which defines our focus for the initial release of Folio in the summer of 2018. Um, the document is managed by Harry Kaplanian, who's the product manager um, for Folio, but the um, content was defined and agreed to by the SIGs. Um, so for each domain area, and they're roughly aligned with the, the special interest groups, the document outlines the high level features that are in scope for V1, um, and it's really, I mean, it's an essential reference point when working through requirements because it gives us clarity around what we still need to define and if conversations lead us astray, which they often do, it's um, really helpful to just come back to this document um, and, and take a look to see, okay, is this actually in scope for, for version one or is it, you know, below the line, so to speak. Um, the other really key resource um, is the platform UX. Um, which um, is best exemplified by the folio prototype, which is an artifact you may have seen. It, um, the prototype encompasses basically the high-level vision for the product. Um, it has all the general UX patterns and platform-wide features. It's, um, it was developed um, by Folio's lead UX designer, Philip Jacobson, in collaboration with the SIGs. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a great thing to check out. Um, you can click around, it's interactive, um, and it just gives you a sense for the kind of the long-term direction of the project. Um, but if you look at the prototype, you will see a lot of kind of gray boxes, which indicate, you know, some content goes here, because it, it really, it's not meant to articulate the details, you know, the details of the feature UX or the business logic that's needed to develop the system. And that's where this next layer comes in, this, um, the feature requirements in UX. I put a box around this because um, I wanted to really emphasize that it's a collaborative process um, and it's not that the UX designer is solely responsible for the UX and the product owner for the requirements. It's actually, um, you know, I see the detailed UX designs as a visual documentation of the detailed requirements discussions we're having in the SIG. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, the, the product owner, the UX and designer and the SIGs are all responsible for these things. Um, and this is really the phase, I would say, where we are spending most of our time with the SIGs um, these days. Um, we're, you know, discussing these written and visual designs and iterating on them until we have something that everyone's satisfied with. And I'll show you some examples of that later on. Um, so the next level down is user stories. Um, so basically, once the feature requirements and the UX have been defined, um, then the product owner will create some user stories for the development team. And what user stories are is, I mean, they essentially break down the complex features that have been defined into smaller, more manageable work increments um, that the tech team can work um, in the context of a sprint. So we are working iteratively according to the principles of agile software development. Um, so we don't wait until we have every last detail figured out before we create those stories and begin development. Um, instead, we write stories when we know just enough to get development going on the fundamental architecture needed. So we call this, this phase the, the rough-in phase where we're just kind of roughing in 
um, the basic feature functionality and architecture. And then we come back later and what we call the refinement phase to enter more detailed stories and get the, the detailed UX and business logic in place. Of course, the user stories go you know, through development. There's a ton that happens in that box, but I'm not gonna get into that here. And then once um, the features have been developed, we then share what's been developed to gather feedback. And there are a few different ways we do that. There is an internal sprint review where the tech team shows their work. Um, and then we have been doing demos um, to the SIGs um, these are led by the product owners. Um, and then uh, finally, what we are moving towards is um, user acceptance testing. So once a feature has passed functional testing, we can release it to um, the members of the SIGs to do UAT. Um, and it looks like users is gonna be the first app that will be ready for UAT. We're not quite there yet, um, but looking forward to getting that started soon. Um, and of course, you know, from these, you know, these reviews and, and testing, um, we get feedback that then, you know, informs again, what, what new feature requirements or change feature requirements we need and, and what changes to the UX. And there's some other feedback loops as well. Um, you can see this one in the upper right, the lessons learned during detailed feature UX, um, they change the originally planned platform patterns or call for new ones, which Philip will, will create. Um, you know, the, the developers are giving feedback on user stories also on, you know, UX design options. So there's a lot of kind of feedback loops here, even ones I haven't, I haven't really called out in the slide. All right, so that was a lot for one slide. And now I want to show you some of those specific documents um, or artifacts I was talking about. So just starting out with the, um, the V1 document in the UX prototype. This is a screenshot of that V1 document. And here you can see some of the um, version one features identified for resource access. Um, you can see, you know, I don't know, configure item and patron default transaction periods, loans, holds, reserves, renewals, and recalls. And while there is a description here, um, there are still many, many details to be defined. So this is really still pretty high level. And then this is a screenshot of the prototype, um, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there are lots of, of other apps um, besides this one. This is the user management app, the users, um, but there are other apps up in the top nav. You can see there, you can click around in, in this thing and, and get a sense for kind of the overall patterns and direction. Um, but just looking at this screenshot for a minute, um, this, what you see here is one of the key UX patterns that has been defined in Folio. So users is an app that needs the ability to search, filter and manage records, user records in this case. But we have, I mean, we have many similar apps in Folio that kind of have that, that need. Um, and so this pattern with the search and filter on the left and the results in the middle and the detailed record on the right is, is something we'll be using. And you'll see um, later on in, in other areas as well. Um, but having the predefined patterns like this one really simplifies things when we get down into the feature um, requirements in UX. We don't need to ask ourselves, you know, how do we represent searching and filtering records? We, we know what that generally looks like. Um, and you can also see here those gray boxes that I mentioned earlier. Um, and these are kind of the areas that we really need to kind of dive in. Um, and where we've been spending a lot of time lately is sort of fleshing out, okay, what are the details that need to display under fees and fines and loans and holds? Um, so that's, that's where we've been spending a lot of time. All right, so moving on down the diagram into the future requirements in UX, a couple things to show here. Um, this is, this slide shows the RA SIG um, reviewing what we call a wireframe, which was created by Holly Misselbauer, who's one of our product owners. Um, so um, requirements discussions will often begin with sketches like this one. Um, this is created in a tool called Balsamic. It's just really quick and easy to manipulate and allows the product owner to kind of quickly put out some rough visual ideas for the SIG to react to. Um, and just, you know, the goal is really to, um, align around what's functionally needed for the feature. It's not, not much attention paid here at all to sort of the, the, um, the actual UI design. This is just like, what do we need to be able to do? And it's just, it's really useful to be able to use um, visuals for that. So this wireframing phase can actually take several discussions depending on the feature. 
Um, but once we've got a pretty good idea of what needs to be there, um, we then um, have the UX designers come in and create high fidelity mockups. So this is a, a hi-fi mockup of a loan record um, that was created by Kimi Kester. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's, it, you know, here we have a much more refined um, layout. Um, we make sure that we're using the, the overall, you know, color scheme and patterns and, um, you know, putting a lot of thought into usability. Um, you might think that with all the work we've done with the wireframes that there wouldn't be that much to do here, but that's not the case. We often have many, many iterations on these mockups, and it seems like, you know, they're really almost never done. We're often revisiting them when, you know, another feature that we're working on suddenly has something that needs to display on this page and so on. So it's a, um, a continuous process. Um, also, when in sort of the detailed functional um, requirements phase, we sometimes will have supplemental written documentation, and you can see an example here. Um, this is a um, Google spreadsheet that we use to capture um, the fields um, for the loan policy. So when we've got a form we're defining that has a lot of fields, like, like the user form or um, the loan policy form, We'll often use um, spreadsheets like this where we can, you know, enter um, the field label, what type of input type is it? Is it, you know, text or is it a select menu? If it's a select menu, what are the values? You know, does the, um, does the um, field display at all times or is it conditional on an earlier selection in the form? So sometimes the best way to articulate all that business logic is actually in a spreadsheet um, like this one. Um, some of the other folio SIGs are using other um, written documents. You may have seen um, things like workflow diagrams um, and things like that. So there's um, often the need to supplement the, uh, the UX design with, with written um, documents and diagrams. Um, and then finally, oh, so this is a, um, a screenshot again of Confluence. And as Deb mentioned earlier, we take lots of notes and those live up on Confluence. And you can see just um, here a list of some of the, the meeting notes that we have up there. All right, and then just moving down to user stories, um, just wanted to show a quick screenshot of Jira. And this is where, this is a tool we use for tracking our, our user stories. Um, in here, you'll find the stories along with other work items for development, like bugs and technical tasks. Okay, all right, so that's enough on sort of the process. And now I wanted to show you some of the features we've been working on defining. So just starting off um, with uh, actually some mockups and screenshots, and then I'll move into like a live demo after this. All right, so requests. Um, requests uh, is an app that's in development. So what I'm gonna show here are some screenshots. So the requests app allows you to view and manage requests such as recalls and holds. And in reality, requests are often initiated by patrons through discovery interface, but there is a need for library administrators to create them by hand as well. And that just seemed that that was the right place to start from a development perspective. Um, so in this screenshot, you see that pattern that we saw in the prototype, you know, this is requests are records and you can search them and filter them and view results. And you can see the results are looking a little messy right now. Um, in this, you see that the request ID is displaying, it's this long sort of internal ID and that's just temporary. Um, we're going to remove that once we've got the other metadata to display, like the title of the item that's been requested, the barcode of the item. Um, the requester, the name of the person who's actually made the request. Um, so this shows sort of how we iterate to get um, to the ultimate goal. Um, this is the um, create request form that um, is in progress right now. Um, so basically, you know, you select the request type at the top. Um, you can select the item to be requested. And then you view some details of, um, of that item, you know, the title, where is it, who's it currently loaned to, what's their patron group, and so on. And these aren't all of the data elements that were requested by the SIG. Um, if we were to look at the mock-up, we'd see a few more things. Um, but these are the things that we've managed to get in place um, already in the system. Um, and then down below, you select the requester, so who is making this request, and you can view some information about them. 
um, their name, their patron group. Again, we're displaying an ID when we should be displaying the actual patron group. Um, they've got some choices, you know, how do they want this request fulfilled, hold shelf or delivery. Um, and then there's some other metadata that you can enter, you know, when does this request expire and what's the hold shelf expiration date. So this was all um, defined by the resource access SIG and um, you are seeing a screenshot of working software uh, in progress. All right, moving on to the users app. Um, so uh, the users app is also in progress. And so the, the following are sort of a combination of screenshots and mockups for that app. And these are in differing states of the requirements process. So you're gonna see some different patterns and data used. Um, some things are more up to date than others. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, hopefully the, the narrative will still make sense. So this is a screenshot of um, the user search and view. And um, again, same pattern. Um, one important thing I guess to call out um, is that in Folio, we have just one repository for users, which contains the records for both Folio operators, as well as patrons um, who don't need to log into Folio. Um, they're mixed together. So um, just something to keep in mind. Um, but here you see, you know, we've actually found a user, we've selected them, and now we're looking at um, their user record. And um, there are many different sections in the user record, which can be expanded and collapsed. Um, user information is, you know, where you'd see their name and their status, their date of enrollment, and so on. So on. Addresses, loan data. Um, the proxy section is open here. And what you see displaying in this screenshot is just the very beginning, the very first pass of roughing in the ability to add proxies. Um, so I actually can show you now a um, mock-up of where we're going with proxy. So imagine we're looking at the user record and we're in that proxy section. This is actually where we're, we're headed with this feature. Um, so from within a, um, uh, within a user, you can add proxies. So if I wanted to add a proxy um, to, let's see, what user record was I on? I was at uh, Chandler Armstrong. So if Chandler Armstrong has a proxy named Skylar Brown, I can come down to this section and I can click add proxy and select Skylar Brown. And then um, I can set some different information. I can, um, indicate, you know, is this proxy relationship status active or inactive? If you're just setting it up, it would probably be active. You can add an expiration date for the relationship. You can set whether notifications should be set to the sponsor or to the proxy. Who should the fees and fines accrue to? Um, can the proxy request on behalf of the sponsor? Um, and then this nice to have feature, once we've got the institutional calendar in place, you can see um, the ability to set the expiration date, automatically set it up to the beginning of the academic term just by clicking a button. So um, lots of sort of detail here and in business logic that may not be obvious even from this, um, this mock-up, but um, this is something that we spent uh, some time with, um, with the resource access SIG. So back to um, the user record, um, we're now looking at another screenshot that shows the loan section open. Um, and you can see that right now we've just roughed in some basic loan statistics, like the number of open loans and closed loans for this user. Um, we need to definitely put some more thought into how we display that data, um, but it's functional. You can um, click those statistics to view the full list of open and closed loans. And I'm just going to jump now into a, another mock-up that shows where we're headed with the loans page. Um, so here you can see all the open loans for the user um, and some actions can be performed on these loans either individually or in bulk using the checkboxes in the, the left-hand column if you want to you know, take action in bulk and then um, use these buttons up here or individually in this menu. Um, <clears throat> you can click here in the um, actions menu to drill down to what we call the loan details. And I'll show you a mock-up of loan details. So um, this shows all of the details about the loan, even more data than what we could 
cram into that um, <laughs> into that last page. I think Deb talked about how we want to see lots of data on the page, and so you can see here we're really we're maxing that out. Um, but you know, there's there's even stuff that you know that 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 didn't fit, and so that 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 displays here up at the top um, of the loan details record, and then you can see down at the bottom that we have kind of an audit trail that captures um, actions that were taken on the loan um, over time. So um, you know. When, when did the action happen? What was it? Um, and who did it? Those sorts of things. And the kinds of actions that will be cap captured there include check out, um, has it been renewed? Um, was it requested? Um, have notifications been sent? Um, due dates changed? Those sorts of things. And then finally, um, I wanted to show some uh, of the mockups in the checkout app. So this is something we've been working on. Actually, Holly's been working on with the SIG um, lately is sort of thinking through what data do we want to display in checkout. Um, and so this is kind of the, the pattern that was established for Folio and checkout. You basically you scan the patron over here. Um, and right now, you know, if you don't, if you don't have the, the library card to scan, you can actually type in the barcode and click find patron. Or you can actually um, click here to open up a little search widget. But once you've found your patron, you can then start scanning the items that they want to check out. Um, and um, those will start displaying over here on the left. So this is sort of the simple case where, um, you know, you've, you've scanned a patron and you've checked out two items. This big checkout completed button here is um, clears the session in a way and allows you to um, start, you know, scanning a new, new patron in their items. Um, this is a little bit more of a complex scenario. So let's say that the patron that um, whose who's, uh, card you've just scanned is actually a proxy um, for one or more uh, people, then you'll get this little pop up that says, you know, is, is Jane Doe acting as herself or um, on behalf of one of her sponsors. And so you get to make a choice. And if you choose one of the sponsors, then things look a little different here you actually see that the borrower is populated with the sponsor's information and then the proxy's information is down here below. And then of course, anything that you um, check out is actually checked out to the sponsor. So these are some of the things that we've been working on lately. All right, and I'm gonna wrap up with um, a quick live demo of a few things. Um, okay. So I'm logged in right now to this Folio development instance, and um, we're looking right now at the users app. Um, and you're able to see, you know, some of the users loaded into the system. This is just some test data. Um, and you can filter and, um, and search the list. And so you see things getting filtered. You can sort different columns. And I'm just going to look for a specific record. There he is. All right. So now I'm viewing the details of um, Fred Witt here. And um, you can see that, you know, most of the important data is displaying here and the data elements that um, we wanted to display and capture for our users. Um, we worked through actually in detail with the user management SIG and then um, confirmed with the resource access SIG. Um, but you'll also see that the layout is not, um, not you know, where it needs to be. So this is um, still in sort of the rough in phase. So what we need to do now that we've got the data there, we need to come back and sort of um, refine the, um, the page. And our, uh, our designer, Kimi Kester, who's been um, working with the resource access SIG and the user management SIG is working on some, some new mockups for kind of an improved layout for this page. Um, but if you scroll down, you can see the beginnings of some of the features we looked at. So, um, you know, we have the ability here to add proxies. And Actually, I think that jumped me right out. Let's get back. Um, really basic ability to add proxies. And we also have the loan section here um, where you can see that there are five open loans and three closed loans for this user. 
I'm just going to drill in and show you what the loan page looks like right now. So it's starting to look like the mock-up. Um, you can see that we've got, you know, a tab for the open loans and closed loans and some of the metadata displaying, but we're working on getting this stuff to link out um, to the instance record and to the item record. Um, we do have the basic ability to um, just renew right now, but we're working on the other functions as well. Um, and you can drill in to view the loan details. So this is yeah, starting to look like the loan details mock-up that I showed. So you can see all of the, the metadata displaying here. Still needs to be, you know, we need to put some thought into the format here. But, um, you know, some of the general functionality is in place. You can see this little audit trail here. I, I set this data up a little earlier today. So you can see it was checked out and then it was renewed a few times. And then if we were to check it in, you'd see an action for that as well. So it's starting to come together. Um, and uh, there's lots of good progress being made. And um, uh, I'm sure we will be showing more interesting things shortly. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Deb. All right, thank you, Kate. You're welcome. <laughs> now let's see if I can share my screen. And I'll take this opportunity to remind people to please enter your questions when you have a chance. Thanks. I don't. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes. All right. So that was a lot that Kate showed you. Um, and it took us several months to get to this point with a lot of conversation. Um, again, a very collaborative group. So what are the lessons that we've learned so far? We have learned lessons and that's good. We've learned that we need the workflows and a system to do what it is we need to do rather than us spending a lot of time tricking the system to do what we think is necessary. We've also learned that it's really good to keep asking ourselves, what, what are we trying to do? It's very easy for all of us to replicate the system that we currently work in because that's how we think. And it's important for us to stop and say, but really, is this the best way to do it? We're really, again, fortunate to have the people involved who've recently been through the process with the Koali Olay product, such as the people from Chicago, uh, David Bodarf and David Larson, as well as um, Sharon and Mark Cannery from Lehigh. Um, they bring us a perspective that's fresh and they know where the pain points are. It's also really good to have people who have worked with other systems, such as Aleph or Voyager, because we all have our pet peeves. What is it that we want the system to do? But we also have things that we like our system. So what could we keep instead of throwing out everything? Again, I keep using the terms collaborative and community-based because that's who we are. We like to work together. Everybody is very active and very willing to share their knowledge and expertise. And we find out what it is we have as common practice and what makes us different. So we can focus on the commonalities so that we all get a, a basic set of activities that we do, but we also need to be able to preserve our individuality. We also have found that it's important to have communications with some of the other SIGs because some of the things that we do crosses over. Kate showed you the user management uh, screens. That's very important because that's up the basis of what resource access does. Also things like item status. Item status means something to us, but what does it mean to somebody in acquisitions or what does it mean in somebody in cataloging? The other thing I think we've learned is trying to define the future is just a wee bit daunting. So maybe by now you're saying, why would I ever participate in this? Well, while I think defining the future is daunting, I think it's also very exhilarating. It's giving us an opportunity to get on the ground floor and not just be handed a product and say, make this work. It's given us the opportunity also to stand back and look at the big picture with our local practices as well. Why do we do the things we do? Do we do it because that's the only way the system will allow it? Or is there a legitimate business reason for us to do it? And how can we be more efficient and better serve our patrons?
And I also believe that when it comes time for each of us to do our own institution's implementation, we'll have a much deeper knowledge base of, about the product and how best to train our staff to make it work for us and to do what we do so well in access services, and that is to serve our patrons. So this slide is just a reminder of our communication channels and to encourage anybody who's interested, and I hope there are people out there who are, in joining us and joining us in this effort to please contact Andrea and here is her email. So that's it from me. Um, please let us know if you had questions um, and we're gonna try and answer them for you. Well, thank you, Deb, and thank you, Kate. Um, I have one question um, just uh, quickly about process a little bit. I think you've referred to the collaborative work well and um, working on sponsors and proxies and requests and loans and details. How do you come to a consensus when you have um, a team that's working collaboratively and that works, you know, you have a lot of voices there. So um, how, does, how does that work when you're working on functionality and designing? How do, how do you come to that consensus? Well, I'm gonna take a stab at this if you don't mind, Kate. I think for one thing, Access services is kind of a different animal. We all uh, have a lot of frontline experience and we know what works and we have to do it fast. Um, we also have, we also are perhaps a little opinionated, but we find that we do have commonalities and that was part of the process. Uh, if anybody's ever done any organizational behavior type stuff, um, it's the forming, storming, norming, and performing. We formed, we started talking about a variety of issues. The functional requirement sheet was very uh, good for us to get together and for us to see that we did have the commonalities. I think this is one of the best groups I've ever worked with in terms of being thoughtful and being willing to listen to other people and not just assume the way we do it is the way it needs to be done. And we have some very persuasive folks <laughs> in our group. I think on the other hand, there are some things that we might be constrained by, by um, functional or design. And so to listen to those, um, hi Andrea, Andrea just came in, she can help too. Uh, to listen to the people who know how to design things and how things should work has also had an influence on our group. So Andre, the question was, how do, we, how do we come to a consensus? Do you want to weigh in on that? Maybe not. Yeah. Kate, do you have anything to say? I would agree. I think everything you said, Deb, was absolutely true. I'm, I have been really pleasantly surprised, honestly, with how flexible um, everyone's been on the resource access SIG, I think, and realistic, you know, it's, it's often tempting to say, well, well, we've got to have it, you know, we, we have to have that, we have to have this, we have to have everything, it's all critically important. And that is actually, you know, not by my experience with this group, I feel like everybody's really understood that we need to prioritize things. Um, and that, you know, we, we need to be realistic about what can get done. And um, so people have been really focused on, you know, what's most important um, and how can we do things simply and um, listening to one another. You know, there have been, when there are disagreements, um, you know, people just ask, you know, what makes you think that? And, you know, why, you know, why is that, why, why is it important that we support it that way for you? And, and sometimes we also need to actually come to the conclusion that different institutions do things differently and what we really need is a solution that, you know, is configurable. Um, so those are some of the ways that we get, get around, um, you know, initial, initial disagreements. Great. That's, thank you very much. That's a great answer to those, my question. Um, any other questions for today? Well, seeing none, I guess that concludes our forum for today. And please feel free, if you didn't ask your question, to continue discussions 
on discuss.folio.org or at Twitter, hashtag Folio Forum. And if you have any ideas for uh, other forums, please um, leave those at those places. That would be helpful to us. Today's recording will be available on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. And our next forum, it will be um, taking place on October 11th, and we'll be looking at the um, discussing the development cycle and how the de development cycle works in Folio. So I would like to thank our speakers today. Deb and Kate did a wonderful job. And thank you all for participating. And we will see you October 11th. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our speakers. <laughs>